Thanks so much, Alexandra. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for this event today. Amy and I are excited to speak with you a bit about the anatomy of an attack and what cyber incident response and events look like in real world companies. Uh, so Amy, to start us off, first question we have for you today is, how do companies know when a cyber event may be happening? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dina. And and by the way, everyone here um, definitely wanted to be uh, a conversation. So if you have any questions, we'd love to take them in at the end of the uh, of the call. Um, so yeah, first question, how do companies know when a cyber event may be happening? I'd say that there's probably three primary sources, um, general types of sources that you get your um, alerting from. Uh, one would be your employees in your company. You know, if um, they find something weird on their machine, it's going slow, or they, you know, got did see a ransom note on, on their computer or server that they're navigating to. Um, got a weird phishing email, You'll, your employees are often um, the ones who are alerting uh, teams about a cyber cyber related event. Second, um, teams that are companies that do have a security operation center like yours, Dina, at, um, that, that you run, uh, you'll get your security alerts that may be telling you about, you know, malware or other anomalous activity on a network that you would get through either your security team or your operation center. Some folks have an outsourced operation center that get these alerts. Um, and then I'd say the third type of, um, let's say a, alert source are external alerts. So these can be clients that your company works with um, or vendors or partners that, that you interact with that maybe they get some weird emails from your, um, your enterprise or, um, or you may also have a third party cybersecurity um, team that is monitoring, or even like the you know, government, FBI, they may alert a company that, you know, you hear some chatter in the dark web about your company, uh, you know, there might be something going on there. Huh? Um, they right. want to, Daniel? sorry, I'm going to mute the TV here. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, having a third party may alert you too if there's an incident that they're um, seeing that may be involving your company. Um, some third parties have, let's say, awareness of um, where third actors are coming from and might see traffic from those um, adversaries towards your network. Um, that may be also a, a source of um, you know, how you find out. And then I'll say also it depends on the type of attack. So if it's like a malware based attack, like a ransomware, uh, as I mentioned, you may see like a ransom note in your environment. Machines may be really slow. Um, you might see uh, some machines are completely encrypted. Um, if it's a business email compromise type of thing, you may have some weird emails that are that you're alerted to. Um, if it's a denial of service attack, you'll have, you know, maybe your website will be down. So it really also depends on the, the type of attack that you're experiencing, what um, type of notifications or alerts you're going to get um, that will tip you off if something's happening. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, as you mentioned, there's so many different sources, so many different types of events that could potentially happen and indicators that something's happening. Um, how do companies respond in these types of situations, given how many different types of sources there are, different types of events there can be? What does response look like? Sure. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to responding to an incident. Um, a lot of different people involved, especially if it becomes like a, a wide scale, um, like a ransomware attack where the whole company is impacted. So I'll say the types of people that are involved, you have, you know, of course, your technical teams, um, your incident response commander, who usually is like the head technical person who is able to kind of coordinate and orchestrate the, the incident response. They have their subject matter experts, you know, your forensics analysts, your security operations analysts, um, and even third parties that are helping you with investigations. So that's like the technical aspect for it, of it. Um, as well as IT support that are helping to keep, you know, your actual applications running and helping to respond um, on the IT infrastructure front. So that's the technical aspect, but then there's a non-technical aspect. There's, you know, human resources. If your employees need to be notified or engaged, maybe their data was impacted. HR needs to help out with that. Um, you have legal who, you know, who are able to assess your obligations and liabilities um, regarding stolen data, 
um, help advise on if there's, uh, you know, ransom payment that needs to be issued, you know, they'll, they'll help with that. And then they also help with retaining other experts that um, maybe needed to help with the response, um, interacting with law enforcement, things like that. You have public relations. Um, so sometimes if there's a widespread incident, you may have customers or even the media coming to you asking like, what's going on? You know, is my data safe? Questions from all over. And you don't want, you know, the responders having to deal with that. So your PR team is also going to need to be involved. And then you have your executives of your company, again, who may be getting questions from media or um, stakeholders. They need to be informed on how to respond. And they also need to be um, part of a lot of the decision making. I'll say, especially with some of the smaller companies that I've helped out with incident response, their CEO is like right on the daily phone calls, um, helping to make decisions on, you know, how do we stop this attack? Um, you know, what do we do? Do we pay ransom? How much am I willing to pay? Things of that sort. So that's like all the people that are involved. And then there's the whole kind of coordination of the of the event itself. So I'd say from a technical perspective, um, typically when you're investigating an incident, you start with, you know, you identify what's going on, you declare there's an incident, um, identify what has been impacted, and then you can contain what has that, you know, contain um, the event, stop the bleeding, as we say. So, you know, if you know the third actor might be on these servers, make sure that it's contained so they can't keep spreading um, and then eradicate them. So get rid of the third actor so they can't come back inside. And during the whole investigation portion of it, that's really a cycle that keeps happening. You know, identify where they are, contain it, eradicate them until you finally come to a point where you feel comfortable that you understand the root cause of the incident. Um, have identified all the areas where the threat actor was, contain the, the event, um, and then finally move on from the incident, hopefully um, into recovery. Yeah, th thank you, Amy. And thanks for hitting on you know, the people, the process, and the technology, because all of those are so important in cybersecurity generally and in incident response. Um, one of the key things I think you spoke about was communication too, and how important it is during the response process. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the recovery process looks like. Communication certainly is important there too, as are many other aspects. So hoping for uh, some thoughts on your experience based on that. Sure, I'll start with the, the communication piece. So I'd say even before the, the recovery process, um, I, I've lightly touched on the fact that there's a lot of people involved here, but as a result, there's a lot of communication that is required to, to occur in order to um, respond to an incident. And when an incident is um, happening at a company, you know, it, things are happening on an hourly basis. You know, your third actor is coming in, trying new tactics. Um, things can change within a few hours. So having daily and, you know, ongoing touch points within your response team is really important. So I'd say, generally speaking, what I've seen in um, cyber incidents is you have executive update meetings where you have, you know, your, your C-suite um, and other non-technical leaders who need to be um, kept up to date and make decisions on what's going on during the incident. Sometimes your board members are included on that as well um, and outside counsel. Then you have your technical update meetings. So oftentimes uh, technical teams will stand up what they call a war room, we call that a war room sometimes, where you have basically an ongoing call or a conference room where everyone's in there kind of doing the response. Um, and then your regular update meetings during that. And then also daily update meetings with legal and PR on what are they doing to um, communicate externally and internally and to stakeholders so that everyone's on the same, um, the same page. So uh, hopefully you plan all those kind of cadences before an incident even happens so that you're not deciding during an incident. Um, and I think we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. So that is a bit on the communication piece. Now, when it comes to recovery, uh, again, recovery can look really different depending on the type of type of incident. Um, I'd say in, in general, uh, what needs to happen before recovery is as I mentioned, you know, making sure that the root cause is understood so that you can patch, harden, and test your affected systems to make sure everything's plugged up. I've seen many cases where, you know, companies think that they 
um, you know, understood the root cause and they think that they have patched up all their systems where the vulnerability was. Uh, and then the third actor just came back in after a couple of days because they didn't fully protect their systems um, from the initial attack. So that that really is is so important to make sure that the root cause is understood. Um, during uh, a lot of attacks, like especially ransomware attacks, um, you know, systems will be compromised. So you'll need to restore from backups. Hopefully uh, the company has backups to restore from. Um, that can take some time, several days often to um, get the backups up and running, make sure that uh, employees are able to use them and they have the data that they need. Uh, and then in some cases, companies need to get replacement machines and hardware. Um, sometimes hardware is taken for forensic, forensic evidence um, for deeper investigations. And some malware is even designed to wipe systems um, so that you can't restore them. A lot of um, you know, industrial control system type of uh, malware um, is designed to you know, wipe registry keys so that you can't boot from the system anymore. And you know, companies have had to buy completely new control system um, yeah, hardware to replace in their control centers in order to you know, get their ship up and running again. Um, during the Colonial pipeline, you know, that, that pipeline was down, the actual operations of the pipeline was down for like about a week, like five days to a week. And, you know, that was national news, international news. Um, but I, I've seen recovery take up to a month um, or more, when, uh, even after the incident is completely done, because it, you know, getting back to uh, restoring your backups and restoring to operations um, can take a long time because it's not just an IT effort, it's an effort for the whole company to make sure that, uh, you know, we're getting back to steady state. It's kind of like, you know, you go to surgery and, you know, you had an accident, you get your surgery done. And then after you're done with your surgery, you're still, you know, you're still kind of in pain, you're still recovering and you need to figure out what to do to move forward. It's the same thing with the cybersecurity incident. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Amy. Recovery can certainly be um, an intense process given how many people have to be involved in, in such a circumstance. And certainly there's a lot that goes into the response too. So hoping to chat a little bit about uh, some things companies can do proactively in order to be better prepared and better positioned for response and for recovery. You touched on a couple, but hoping you can go into some details there. Sure, yeah. I'd say foremost, having an incident response plan is something that, is low cost to get just a simple plan together um, so that you know, at least have a, a run book to, to, to refer to when you're in the middle of an incident. You don't wanna to have to be thinking through that during the actual incident itself. You wanna have much as possible think, thought through it beforehand. So your incident response plan is gonna have things like, what is your communication strategy? Um, what's the contact list of people that you need to call that need to be involved? Um, what are the roles and responsibilities? I mentioned all the different types of people that need to be involved, but you have to, des you have to designate who that is, um, as well as designations of who are the external parties that you need to contact. Maybe you have cyber insurance that you need to um, enact, or your incident response retainers that you need to enact, and you don't want to have to be searching for those phone numbers or those contact lists during the incident. So having that all in your plan um, is really good, even on how to declare an incident. You know, uh, there's different types of uh, severities of an incident. Some severities, you may do different types of things, different types of responses, you might bring in different parties. So just being able to hash that out all beforehand will really help um, for, you know, during the real event. And then I'd say like things like running different types of exercises for your employees. So having tabletop drills where you can simulate um, in a widespread, a widespread incident, you know, talk it through, you know, if a ransomware attack were to happen at my company, uh, how are we going to respond? And again, this is not just at a technical level, this is also with the executives. So I always recommend companies at least, you know, once a year, get your executives around, around um, a table. You know, this is hopefully your CEO, your CFO, CRO, head of HR, all those who would be involved in decision-making during a large incident and have them talk it through. Um, and, and I'd say that more often than not, uh, executives are surprised at how much they will need to be involved when something is going to happen and how uh, much they, more planning they need to do. 
um, especially af after they do their first kind of tabletop drill. So doing that again is um, is a great way to prepare beforehand. And then you know training your regular employees with phishing tests and different kind of cyber awareness campaigns so that they know, you know, these are the type of things that are in the realm of possibility uh, of happening to us as uh, a company. And this, these are the contacts that you need to get in touch with if ever you see anything weird on your computer. Um, and, you know, keeping them aware so that they're, they're um, able to raise if there's any issues and they know how to respond um, if anything comes up. Yeah, I think the point you raise on awareness is so important because um, certainly employees at a specific company, at any company, are, are a line of defense, right? They see something and they report it, and that's a way that cybersecurity teams can find information, as you're talking about before, and respond. Um, we spoke we spoke a lot in general about different types of cyber events and the ways we would respond to them. One of the ones that's often or more often in the news makes headlines is ransomware. So we were hoping you can and talk a little bit about how to deal with ransomware. You know what happens? Um, do companies pay? What's what's your experience and and some background on ransomware? Sure. Um, yeah, that, that's a that's a a big one. So ransomware is is. I'd say it's what we hear about a lot in the news and you hope that it doesn't happen to you, but I've unfortunately experienced um, with a lot of different companies, um, you know, ransomware attacks and having to help them respond. So I'd say, you know, maybe I'll just take it from the beginning to end and what happens and then different kinds of ways that it trees out. So typically, um, you know, uh, ransomware will get caught by any of the three ways that um, I mentioned earlier, you know, your em employee may alert you to some slowness on their computer or they're trying to access a server and it's, um, you know, they're unable to access it because it's encrypted. Sometimes people find a ransom note or sometimes your security um, operation center will alert you to some um, alerts that are popping on their, on your endpoint defenses. Um, excuse me. Yeah, uh, I'd say that those are the two primary ways, ways that it gets identified and then it spreads really fast once it gets in. Um, so the um, for those who I'm pretty sure everyone here is likely aware about, about ransomware, but let me just take a step back. So ransomware is a type of malware where um, the threat actor will uh, deploy it on your machine and then it quickly, sp quickly spreads across your environment and it, it will one encrypt your um, servers and your computers uh, so that it cannot be accessed by um, your employees. And um, two, they'll often exfiltrate data. So they'll try to find you know, your, your SharePoints or your file servers or your critical data and steal it. You know, they'll bring it up to a cloud server um, and, and download it to their environments. Um, and then three, they would hold you ransom. So they'll say you have to pay X amount of Bitcoin in order to get the key to decrypt your systems and to avoid um, kind of public embarrassment and shaming. Uh, if you don't pay, we're going to uh, post all of your stuff online. So that's typically what, um, that's what a ransomware attack is. So back to like kind of what, what happens in, in, in the real world. So it's, um, a company gets all their machines encrypted and then they can't access it. So the next steps need to happen really quickly. You call your incident response retainer, hopefully you have a retainer, um, but you're any third party firm that is able to help with response. I say that you should likely have a retainer because um, oftentimes incident response companies are really bogged down by a lot of requests at one time whenever a threat actor is you know, pushing out attacks. They'll often get, um, you know, have a lot of clients, and then sometimes I've seen them not able to help uh, different companies because they didn't have a retainer with them. So that's just one thing uh, to note for this group as you're working with your um, companies now or in the future, uh, making sure that you have a retainer. So you call your incident response retainer. You call your, um, you know, your third-party cybersecurity general counsel, and then you assemble your incident response team. Um, you go through kind of the steps that I mentioned earlier of how an incident response looks like, but a difference here is this aspect of threat actor negotiation. Um, so with a ransomware attack, 
the threat actor will often leave a note that says, you know, contact me, contact me here, or, you know, this is the group that we're from. And there are actually third parties that uh, specialize in threat actor negotiation and know, you know, the type of ways that third actors like to communicate, are able to get in touch with them on dark, excuse me, on, the, on dark web channels and um, are able to kind of play a role to help negotiate down any ransomware payment. So that brings me to ransomware payment itself. You know, do you pay, do you not pay? I'd say there's a really split, um, split jury on this. Generally speaking, what I've seen is um, threat actors, again, generally, um, or rather people ask, you know, ask me, do threat actors really, you know, um, hold to their world, hold to their word that they're not going to publicly shame you even after you pay ransom. And I, my answer to that is typically they do because they want to build a reputation of, um, you know, actually holding to their word so people continue to pay them in the future. Um, so uh, I'd say that certain threat actor groups, um, oftentimes we, people or, you know, incident response firms recommend that you do pay because they will, um, you know, they keep to their word, they won't share your information um, and they go away. Uh, there are circumstances where threat actor groups are affiliated with, let's say, you know, um, the terrorist organizations. And in those cases, uh, definitely, generally the advice is to not pay um, because that's some other kind of federal and legal issue involved with paying terrorist organizations, of course. Um, but I'd say also, if you have cyber insurance, um, you know, part of the payment can come from your, uh, your coverage there. Uh, if you, so that's like the ransom, ransom payment uh, aspect. I actually was responding to an incident this weekend um, where we were speaking with a threat actor and uh, discovered that they would belong to this specific group who has been known not to hold to the word of, um, you know, uh, not um, revealing information. Uh, this third actor group actually was known for keep on coming, keeping on coming back to um, uh, re-extort their victims. So in that case, you we decided not to pay. So really, it depends case by case by the threat actor. Um, so that's the ransom payment part of that. And um, I remember the last part of your question there, actually. Yeah, no, I, I think you hit it. And, you know, ransomware, as you're describing, is a tricky situation and lots of decisions need to be made and written pretty quickly. Um, are there anything companies can do to proactively try to protect against ransomware? You spoke about some general advice before, but thinking more specifically on ransomware, is there, is there anything companies should consider or should take action on? Yeah, I'd say that, uh, believe it or not, the the most most of the root causes of these ransomware attacks are things that are preventable preventable in um, uh, if if you just did like a little bit of care beforehand. So, and it's not that complex. I'd say most of the ransomware um, uh, cyber criminal groups that use ransomware, most of them are really just trying to get some low hanging fruit. Um, I, I, Oftentimes, uh, another question that I'll get is, you know, we're not a really big company, um, you know, are we, really, are we really a target? And I'd say the answer is definitely yes. Um, ransomware groups will scale their ransom ask um, based on the, uh, the size of the company that they're attacking and based on the revenue of that company. So they'll take um, like, let's say that your company has, you know, $5 million in revenue a year. Um, they'll take like, they'll do like a 10% um, ransom ask on that. And that's typically how they, um, a 10% is a number they made up, but they'll typically um, take a percentage of that and use it as the ransom asks, ask. So I'd say everyone's a target. Um, what you do is make sure that you're not the softest target. And that's really what you got to do. So things like, um, you know, making sure that you have your basics in place, have you know multi-factor uh, authentication for any remote login, for your webmail, um, have your endpoint protection. A lot of times I've seen ransomware get caught by like your EDR 
or even your antivirus because they don't really use, um, you know, like the latest and greatest all the time. Oftentimes they can get caught by, the, by these um, security tools. Uh, having your network security implementations in place. So filtering, um, you know, bad web traffic, uh, you know, just using your firewall if you're a small company. Um, but if you're a more complex company, you can do things like having, you know, your web proxy and filtering and DNS security in place. Um, having backups too, I'd say that, and having them properly segmented. So I, I've seen cases where um, the threat actor encrypted the company's backups, um, the backups that they were saving for the event of a cyber incident. And then uh, the day came, but their backups were not probably seg properly segmented and they all got encrypted. So they had to pay, it's like $2 million in ransom um, to get the encryption key. So having them segmented properly, had another case actually where the backups were segmented properly, but the, um, the management, servers that are used to manage the, the backups, that was not segmented. The management server got encrypted, so they couldn't even access the backups anyway. So like making sure that they're set up really properly upfront is super important. Um, and, and yeah, I'd say that like, and between having your backups, you know, your basics in place, um, your remote login in place, uh, your remote login protections in place, um, and having your employees aware on, you know, not to click on phishing emails. Um, it's really these basics, having these basics in place is important. Actually, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, I, I'd say that like uh, another, you, you, you work in, um, you know, your security operations center, and I'm sure that, um, that working at Con Ed, you know, you have a lot of um, uh, companies that you work with, small mom and pops that you work with, um, and people in the city that you work with. And um, I know how how do you guys respond to um, you know attacks that you might see from compromised uh, small companies? Uh, you know, is that something that you guys see? Um, what do you typically do, or what what's the right thing to do in those cases? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say one of the things we we look out for and and respond to, and I think many many companies do is business email compromise. So, you know, you're working with mom and pops, you're working with smaller companies or even larger companies sometimes, and they they encounter, they suffer a cyber breach or some sort of incident. We then potentially, or any company can then potentially receive a compromised email from that, from that organization. Um, so this is something we, we absolutely look out for. We have email protections in place. So we use a variety of different tools as do other companies in order to look at emails um, try to block bad things from coming in. And we also have a program where employees are aware of our cybersecurity operations center and can report anything that looks suspicious um, or they didn't really expect. We encourage employees not only to report what looks suspicious, but if something you know comes in that's abnormal, you weren't expecting a communication, we try to funnel those through our, our organization, our SOC as well. Um, when this does happen, we're able to do a, an evaluation on the email. we we'll then reach out to the vendor and we work with them, um, work with our business partners in the company as well to make sure everyone's aware of what's going on in order to assess and protect our company and then work with the vendor to remediate what they need to do on their side as well um, before we resume any normal communications with them or our normal business with them. And we try to work the best we can with the vendors and our business partners in order to continue operations during this process and certainly prioritize um, and ensure the risk to our company is minimal from a cyber perspective. Um, and, and Amy, as you mentioned, a lot of these vendors in our observation and in the wild in general tend to be smaller shops and mom and pops. Um, is there anything small companies specifically, maybe ones without those higher budgets can do to protect themselves from these types of attacks or others? Yeah, uh, I alluded to this earlier, but really having the, the basic controls in place will make you the, le the least squishy target out there. And that's just really what you want to want to do. So, you know, I, I mentioned the multi-factor authentication for your webmail and your remote login. That's that's like number one, Make, making sure that that's protected is is really good um, and, and and is really a primary vector that threat actors use, you know, they'll scan the network for um, VPN clients and then attempt to, to log into them or scan for, you know, different um, 
Office 365 accounts and try to log into them. So as long as you have multi-factor authentication on them, you, you're already ahead of a lot of the other um, companies out there. Uh, the incident that I was referring to from this weekend, um, they did not have multi-factor on their uh, VPNs and that's how the third actor was able to get in, right? Um, oftentimes employees will say that this is like inconvenient for them and, you know, it's annoying having to, you know, do the multi-factor, like receive a phone call or get the push notification. But, um, you know, this is explained to them that it's this, that the, you know, the one to two seconds of inconvenience can save millions of dollars for your organization. Um, it's, it's absolutely worth it. So having that multi-factor is really important. Um, having your endpoint protection. So, Again, the antivirus, um, if you're a really tiny shop, you know, there's plenty of uh, really affordable antivirus solutions out there. Um, if you have a little bit more of a, of a um, IT budget, you know, having your uh, EDR installed is, is really good. Again, I've, I've seen that as uh, a way that ransomware was caught when it was deployed on an endpoint. Um, it was caught via the, their EDR. Um, yeah, your network filtering, um, DNS security, you know, blocking bad websites, blocking uncategorized websites. I think that's a really highly effective way to, um, you know, get low hanging fruit attacks. And um, I'd say patching and like your vulnerability management program. Um, again, if you're a small shop, just turn on your auto updates. Uh, that's like something really simple that you can do for Mac. Um, your Mac OS, as well as your uh, Windows machines, you know, turn on your auto patching, um, make sure that your applications are being patched um, and that machines are kept up to date. Um, super, super important. And, and maybe lastly, uh, related to that, again, as like a, law, a low cost um, thing that companies can do is reduce or remove administrative permissions from um, your servers, from your users, uh, onto servers and onto their local machines. So threat actors will um, often, if not always, try to escalate their privileges um, to be able to be an administrator on their target machines. So um, and a, a downfall is that companies may provision their users with too many permissions. Um, oftentimes this is because their users want to be able to install whatever software they want on their computer or, you know, access whatever they need to do. And really, this is not a great security practice. Um, so reducing your administrative permissions for your users, super important, um, and as well as as well as your servers. And then backups, I, I mentioned the, the backups um, part of it. Oftentimes, like your cloud environments, you can just pay for them to, to do backups for you. Um, but in general, if you're unable to pay for backing up everything, identify what's critical to you. Like if you had an incident and you didn't have anything um, or you, you, you didn't have most of your environment, which pieces of it are absolutely critical for you to keep um, operations going if you're going to be offline for, let's say, a week or, or even more? Um, how do you keep the cash register of your company flowing? Um, so those are low cost things to do that um, I think pretty much everyone should be doing. And truthfully, large companies struggle with those things because they're so big. Um, so that's maybe to the advantage of these small companies to, to get these basics in place. Yeah, th thanks, Amy. And thanks also for underscoring not only there, but in general today, the importance not only of the technology, but of having awareness, having that people element for response and the process element for response. He spoke a lot about vulnerability management programs, about incident response processes and planning those communications in, in advance of an incident so companies are better ready to respond. I think it's so important, not only technology, but the people and process elements to all of this as well. Um, we'd, we'd now love to open it up for any questions anyone may have. So if you want to use the chat or raise hand feature, um, we'd love to take any questions. I'd say that while people are thinking, um, about uh, about questions, I can speak to. Uh, I was thinking earlier during our conversation when you were talking about business email compromise, um, and I, I could talk through uh, 
what happens during one of those those incidents because I again I just had um, a, a client deal with that last week. So um, and then also preventative measures that that you can you can do. So um, the other week um, I had one company who had um, their email compromised. So as you can guess, they didn't um, they didn't have two factor on their webmail turned on. So they, an employee used the same username and password um, for the work email as they did, you know, another site. Um, the threat actor got a hold of that, logged into their email, and then what the threat actor does is they uh, first will often create rules in your um, mailbox to hide the evidence that they've been in there. So sometimes they can be there in there for um, several days, even weeks, without you noticing. They'll either delete their um, automatically delete the messages that they send from your mailbox, or they'll forward it to um, another folder that you might not be checking, uh, and you won't realize that they, they're actually actively using your email. Um, then what the threat actor does is they'll contact. Um, you know, your third parties or vendors that you may be working with and who may be paying you. Um, and they will request that you ch they change the account information, like a banking account information to a new account. Um, and then try to solicit funds from your third parties to um, pay funding to a new account. Um, oftentimes this is how, uh, again, these like mom and pops will get uh, compromised because they they don't realize that they see that the email is coming from the legitimate company that they're working with, but um, in fact, a hacker got into their into their email, and uh, I've seen companies lose hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in this way. Um, and it's really hard to recover the funds. What the threat actor does is once a um, company pays to the um, fraudulent um, bank account, they will immediately remove the funds from the account within you know an hour or two. So by the time that the police or whatever um, agency in which country um, you know checks in with the bank, the funds are already gone and they moved um, moved elsewhere. So it, it's really, really hard to recover funds when uh, you have a business email compromise. I have one, another case actually that um, this one's more of a positive story uh, and it was just last month where, um, the company that got compromised, they, uh, who got their email hacked, they had multi-factor enabled. However, the threat actor kept attempting to log in to the email and it annoyed the employee so much so that they just hit yes on their multi-factor. Then they let the, the threat actor in. So in that circumstance, it's, uh, we, we call that MFA fatigue when uh, a threat actor will keep trying to log into your system and it just kind of annoys the employee so much that they let the, the actor in because um, they're fatigued by the, the MFA alerts. So in this case, the third actor logged into the email, st started emailing all the employees in the company to change the account information. Thankfully, the um, company had processes in place to do a voice call back to um, whoever is asking for an account change. They called the guy and said, hey, is this you? And he said, hey, that's not me. And that's how they found out that um, actually his email was compromised. So um, in, you know, in this industry, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is this concept of defense in depth. So it's having both the, the technology um, pieces in place that if one portion fails, something else will hopefully catch the issue, but also having the people and process um, aspects in that. So having processes in place that people can use to make sure that, you know, all the transactions that are occurring are not fraudulent um, in case any of our technical controls fail. So that's that's a, another common one, as you mentioned, Dina, the CMO compromise is, is pretty rampant. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, pause for any hands or questions, if there are any. Um, otherwise, Amy, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so based on your experience in incident response, you spoke about a lot of different experiences. You've had some fairly recent. What would you say is the number one threat to different organizations um, based on what you've seen? Yeah, that is um, a good question. I would say that 
the number one threat, maybe, maybe this is an unconventional answer here, but the number one threat is um, the lack of completeness of control. So what I mean by that is uh, a company thinks that they have a control fully in place, so they are no longer paying attention to it anymore. They think that they're good. And then that's the way that the threat actor often gets in. I'd say that most of the cases that I've seen this year are cases where a company thought they had a control in place, so they weren't looking at it anymore. And that is the way that the threat actor was able to get into the environment. So the way to, to combat that is um, you know, having either constant or continuous monitoring of your environment for vulnerabilities, be it through scanning or things of the like, or processes in place where you can check to make sure that all um, that your, your control is complete. So as an example, let's say um, for endpoint protection on all of your computers, uh, make sure that you're getting a management report or you have some sort of compliance report that helps you check that all machines have this covered. Or if it comes to remote access, make sure that there is a process in place that um, brings a security team in to check that you know the right um, blocks are in place, multi-factors in place for remote access. So I'd say that um, from a, from a um, posture perspective, that's probably the, the biggest threat, the lack of completeness of control. And then I'd say um, in general, uh, from the threat actor side, I'd say that ransomware is still something that I'm seeing this year as, um, you know, really persistent. Um, one thing that is kind of changing that I've, I've been seeing is, is um, a bit more uh, harassment from third actors actually, um, where they will be persistent in, um, you know, contacting executives or, uh, you know, I've seen even people, uh, third actors contact um, families of executives uh, you know, find find their information online and just bother them. So even if you know the the company has the backups in place and you know was able to restore their environment to normal, they'll pay the threat actor anyway because they're just you know being they're harassing um, their employees. So um, you know, uh, I would say as much as you can spend time on preventative care in your environment um, it is way worth it because the uh, emergency care, so responding to incidents, you know, dealing with aftermath, that is like way more painful than you wanna have to ever deal with. So as much as you can, you know, have the uh, completeness and controls in place, um, having your defense in depth, um, training your employees, having your response plans ahead of time will save you a lot of headache and legal troubles, media troubles in the future. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, that really underscores um, also the, the risk assessment and compliance functions too that go into not only the proactive, which of course is a big, big role for them, but also the response as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Actually, I have a question for you because um, sure. something that we didn't touch on is uh, that much is threat intelligence. So, you know, I was talking about the threat actors and what they do, but from your perspective, you know, running a threat intelligence team, how does that fit into um, how companies prepare for an incident or, or protect themselves from an incident? Yeah, I, I think threat intelligence helps in a couple of different ways. And I think both in the reactive way and a proactive way, um, piggybacking off what you said before. So from a reactive perspective, Threat intelligence is really good because if you if you know of a specific, let's say, indicators that are associated with an ongoing attack, or if you know of certain groups and TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures that are associated with something that's really prevalent in the wild, um, you can reactively look for them. So you, you kind of get this information um, and you can go into your environment and say, am I impacted by this? So with that intel and of course with proper tooling and processes, you're able to go and check and do that. Um, from a proactive perspective, it's also really helpful to have a good understanding of those threat groups that you were talking about before earlier, Amy, and different techniques associated with them, because you can proactively go in and, and look for things in your environment that could potentially indicate something is wrong or something is up. Um, from an incident response perspective, it's really important too. So during an incident, if you do uncover something, 
Um, you might be able to pivot and investigate based on intelligence that you have. So you're seeing one thing, but maybe you know that one thing or that one indicator or that one tactic is often associated with a different group or with these additional indicators or additional tactics. And you know that through intel. So you're able to do, I think, a more thorough investigation um, when you have that information, you have it processed and you have it associated and correlated in, in the right way. And how do you get, um, how do you get intelligence or intelligence? Who do you receive it from? Um, especially if you're a company without a big um, operation center, you know, where can you get information about threat actors? Yeah, there, there's a variety of sources. Um, there's public information available online. So that's sort of a first place to start. Security companies will offer that information. Um, depending on your industry, there's also government sources and agencies that can provide it. And there's certainly um, paid intelligence where there are vendors who specialize in providing threat intelligence for those companies that do have the budget or the resources that they want to allocate um, to threat intelligence. Um, but even just general information on, online is a good place to start for some of those smaller mom and pop places, um, as well as government agencies where that's applicable. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat if you're up for them, Amy. I know we have a couple minutes left. Sure. Um, so pivoting just a bit, uh, we have one question that says, what if the same group keeps attacking you? Would it be a good idea to try to find them? So that's the first question we have for you. Sure. Uh, generally speaking, the answer is no. Don't try to go find them. Um, you don't want to, one, you don't want to you know, antagonize these kinds of groups. You don't know, they're criminals, so you don't know what they're, they're going to do. As I mentioned, we have this other group who's emerging that is um, getting more physical with it and you know, harass, doing more harassment type stuff. Um, two, you know, it, you don't, um, generally speaking from like a law enforcement perspective, you, you don't want to be attacking the, the attackers. What you can do though, is report it to again, law enforcement. You should, in fact, on the first, the first time that you are subject to a ransomware attack or a, a large scale attack, you should absolutely be contacting your local FBI office, um, cause they might, may, they are likely collecting information about this from other resources as well. And it'll help with catching these bad guys. Um, so that's, that's your biggest weapon I'd say, um, against the actor is one, protect yourself, but two, report it to authorities so that they can build the case and they'll definitely, um, uh, have more of a hammer than, uh, you know, us as individuals to, to get the actor. Um. Thanks, Amy. So, so we have another question here about why the FBI or I guess different government agencies can't find the majority of these criminal groups. So, so what do they do to be so evasive in some cases? Yeah, so I would say there's a combination of, of reasons. One, uh, it's when I'll address that, I don't think it's, it's not always that they can't find them. It's that um, there's a lot of complications, especially when it comes to international relations and, and these third actors that makes the in, makes the um, landscape a bit more tricky to navigate. Um, and oftentimes they will require a lot of very hard evidence um, before uh, you know, going to another country and saying, hey, we think that someone in your, um, in your country or maybe um, related to your government is attacking us. That's a really big thing as the, you know, the United States or whatever country um, is doing this to go to another country and accuse them of this. So I'd say that there's a long, pro it's not that they don't know, it's a long process to, um, to get all the parts in place before bringing that to another nation. So I'd say that that's one aspect of, the, of, of this. Um, but from the uh, evasiveness perspective of the threat actor, um, they also do things as, as you alluded to, that um, make it challenging. So they'll um, certain certain threat groups have specific te tactic techniques and procedures, as you mentioned, Dina, that they like to use. But they also know of each other's techniques. So they may do something like put in comments in a different language that might be of a different com um, country and try to divert when, when people are doing investigations and analysis of the malware. They may um, use those techniques to throw off the scent, things like that. Um, there's also, you know, uh, using infrastructure in other countries. Um, VPNs are really easy to spin up and make your IP address look like it's coming from the Netherlands or South Africa or literally anywhere in the world to also help throw off the scent. 
and uh, any you know halfway smart third actor will constantly change the infrastructure that they're using so that um, you know it's this whack-a-mole game that um, you need to do to, to chase them. So I think between between one the the challenging part that our law enforcement has in getting the book of evidence required to um, to attribute uh, um, a threat actor, and then also the um, these kind of easy technolo uh, technological ways for an actor to evade and also throw off the scent makes it, um, sometimes it takes a long time to attribute. I will say in general though, um, attribution comes more quickly like nowadays than it used to years ago. Um, I feel I feel that um, we're, we're, generally speaking, we're much more quicker to, to attribute other, um, attribute threat groups as well as other countries if, if it's the case um, as, as the perpetrators, uh, largely also because we have a really big cybersecurity community now um, with cybersecurity researchers and different companies, um, cybersecurity companies that work together and share intelligence. Um, I think the information sharing is much more quick nowadays than it used to be between these entities. So I think attribution in general um, is getting better. Thanks for the detailed answer, Amy. And so one of the follow-up questions you got from that is, should we then assume, or can we then assume that threat actors are a step ahead of our cybersecurity protections? I think that, well, we should always assume that because that's how you make sure that you are um, on the forefront of protecting your organization. You don't wanna be on your back foot in, in these types of things. So in general, yes, do always assume that. Um, but are they really? I'd say that they can move more quickly than um, you know, law, large law enforcement organizations or governments move. You know, a, a small criminal organization can very quickly pivot their um, their tactic if they see that um, it's getting caught a lot. And that's different than even on a company wide level. It can be hard to to switch feet that quickly. Um, so, but but still, time and time again, it's the low hanging fruit type of protections that they often go for. Um, and I'd say regardless of how much a threat actor may change their tactics, um, more often than not, it's some basic control, um, endpoint protection, network protection, multi-factor, um, things like that, that would have stopped the, or you know, an aware or uh, employee awareness that would have stopped um, the actor anyway. Yeah, it's it's interesting how many times it's the basic controls that would have helped. So thank, yep. thanks for that, Amy. Um, being cognizant of the time, I think we have about five minutes left. Um, if there are any additional questions in the chat, I do see one about contact information for after the event. Um, Alexandra, maybe you can help us with that um, when we wrap up. I just want to open it up to any last questions. Amy, anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Nope. I think that we covered a lot of ground here. Maybe the you know main takeaways is as much as much preventative care as you can do um, is the right way to go. Uh, having your incident response plan in place, thinking through the scenarios with your executives. Again, low, low cost low cost ways to help prevent an attack, um, and think about getting the completeness of your basics in place um, and. You don't need to get fancy with it, especially if you have a small budget. Um, you know, just getting, you know, making sure that your systems are patched, having your endpoint protection, having good cyber hygiene, um, that goes a long way so that you're not the squishiest target out there is really the important thing. Thanks, Amy. Thanks so much again, everyone, for joining us. Um, Alexandra, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, seeing no additional questions to wrap us up. Yes, thank you both for presenting today. And I did see a, cop a question regarding a copy of the recording. So I'll send a copy of the recording and contact information to everyone who registered for this event. And we thank all of our alumni for joining us this afternoon and hope you will zoom in for the next cybersecurity faculty lecture led by Justin Campos on September 14th at noon. This concludes the program and we wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.